Um, good evening, everyone. As I said, you said, I'm Diana. I am the head of committees for the African Student Association Tilburg. And I would like to officially welcome you all to our symposium entitled The Origin of African Legal Thinking. Um, I would like to give a warm and special welcome to the Ambassador Judith Sijeni. She is the Deputy Head of Mission of the Kenya Embassy here in the Netherlands. Um, yeah. <laughs> And thank you all once again for coming and giving up your Tuesday evenings, especially for those who have traveled from far away and those who are streaming in from far away. One of our speakers is actually in Kenya right now. So, yeah. And yeah, so this is our symposium. And the reason I, we decided to have the talk be about this is growing up, uh, most of the history that we had heard about African countries, myself primarily, was about the colonial encounter, what happened to African countries before colonization, during colonization, and then after their independence. While this history is definitely important, um, it gave the impression that law came to Africa through colonialism. And this is an impression that I carried with me until I started doing my law degree here at Tilburg University and I actually started to understand what law is, the definition of law. And that's the first moment I displaced this misconception. And um, I hope you are all curious to find out about the true origins and how our societies are ordered. Uh, yeah, I've definitely taken the curiosity with me. And I hope you're all curious. Please do engage with us throughout the evening as we hear the various sources, the various speakers tell us about their specific aspect about African legal thinking that they will be talking about. Um, so our four different perspectives on the origin of um, African legal thinking will be taken by Cecil Abungu, who will be covering law and philosophy. We will have Deepak Mawar talking to us about international law and Aurelita, Aurelia Rita, I'm so, so sorry, Marcellus, um, who will be talking to us from a human rights law perspective. And finally, we will have Rekana Isong talking to us about um, data law in practice. She's a data protection officer. And yeah, the, the symposium will be recorded. And like I said to said, there will be various QR codes shown after each speaker so that you can take note of your question. The QR code will take you to a Mentimeter so that you can fill them in or just keep your question in mind. And then after the speakers are done speaking, uh, put up your hand and we'll have a Q&A session. So it will be like a panelist discussion towards the end. Um, that being said, I would like to turn to hand over to Aisa too to introduce our first speaker, Cecil. Yes, perfect. So like Diana said, um, this is the first uh, QR code for the questions you might have. Can I go back one slide? <laughs> yes, the other one. Yeah. Um, you can also go to menti.com and fill in the code down below if you're not able to scan the QR code. And it's basically just to fill in your question throughout the evening and we will come back uh, to them um, afterwards. Don't worry about it, we will show this uh, QR code throughout the evening. Okay, so our first speaker is Cecile. Uh, he's a Kenyan-based uh, researcher with the University of Cambridge. He will tell us more about law and philosophy uh, with African legal thinking. Uh, the question he will answer or talk about are how, how are Western morals different from African morals. Um, he will tell more about law and philosophy and how it merged with African law, basically. Um, okay, so good evening. Um, my name is Cecil. Uh, so, hmm. okay, so I uh, was trying to figure out how exactly to, to structure this talk. Uh, I, co I concluded that the best thing I could do was sort of uh, give a general uh, theory of what's what's what sort of philosophical thinking goes behind how 
how Africans are interacting with law, um, or what sort of thoughts, what sort of thought, philosophical thinking goes behind how Africans interact with law. Um, before that, I, just some caveats. Uh, the first one is that obviously, so it's, so it's like a philosophical meaning, like there's a lot of general, general, generalization that might you know, like, I guess if you dig deep enough, you'll find exceptions to it. Um, and, um, that I suppose the evidence is imperfect. I'm using a, a, a very, um, constrained case study. Um, so I'm trying to const constrain things. And so, okay. So, um, the ideas I'll talk about are based on, um, the kinds of arguments made in courts. So what kind of, so what do, what do the formal laws say? Uh, what sort of arguments are made in courts and what sort of interpretations do judges give? Um, and then also on top of that, um, how does the, I guess the general public, and I, I suppose on, on this question, it's like, uh, mostly based on how I see people responding to certain arguments in when speaking in person um, or on social media, Africans specifically, um, how do they respond to certain arguments? Um, what's crazy? What's a crazy argument? And what's not a crazy argument? What's obvious and what's not obvious, etc. Okay. Uh, all right. So, in in general, my thesis is that behind uh, how Africans understand law is a bipolar understanding of a bipolar understanding of what it means to be a person. So um, this is not an original idea. Okay, some of it is not an original idea. So what do I mean? Okay, so um, there is the understanding of personhood that arrives via uh, colonial, col colonialism. Um, okay. And, and, and is sort of, uh, engendered, um, or permanently hammered through colonial, the colonial legal project, um, the rules that are set up, the, um, uh, uh, bureaucracy and what the bureaucracy is forcing people to do. And that's an understanding of, I, to some degree, eventually, um, that personhood is based on uh, the fact that you're, you're a human being, um, and that's all, but there's, there's plenty of, uh, African legal philosophers who've, uh, who've discussed personhood. Well, like that Africans historically understood personhood, many African communities to be more exact, because Africans are not a uh, one hegemonic unit, but like many African communities understood personhood to be, you're a person only when you fulfill your duties towards others. So your personhood is fundamentally based on the duties you fulfill towards the, the communities that you live in. So, um, essentially then you see the, how this becomes a question of individualism versus more communal, communalistic, uh, thinking. So, um, how do you, how are you fulfilled? Uh, you're fulfilled only when you fulfill your duties towards others, or you're fulfilled when you're able to flourish individually. Okay. So, um, now how, how do we see this in real life? So if you have a look at like, like the rights disputes, the, um, disputes about rights particularly. Um, there's, there's certain, on certain issues, okay, in general, where courts are free, where courts are, where courts seem generally to be free, so that's a caveat, courts are free, A, um, that is the state is not, uh, advancing its, uh, well, like it is not essentially like has a, has a, gr a grab on the, on the courts where courts are free and generally judges uh, are free to make decisions um, the way they think uh, the con their constitutions and, and justice requires, 
then you see that um, this more individualistic understanding of what it means to be free or what it means to be a person um, succeeds uh, in general. So the kinds of arguments made um, and the kinds of arguments taken. And anyway, the written law itself, the formal law also reflects that for the most part. Like if you look at many of the constitutions, they have uh, liberal democratic bills of rights. Um, they're, they're written in ways that in, uh, emphasize the in, an individualistic uh, understanding of um, what it means to be a person and what it means to be free. But then there are, when you actually, well, I guess this is one of those places where I, I can't like provide a written evidence, you know, but like when you examine um, what sort of arguments are, are accepted as um, as uh, plausible or what sort of arguments are thought of as crazy. And let, let me give you an example. So on the question of um, uh, like sc schools deciding, for example, that um, students shouldn't wear hijabs um, or uh, schools uh, deciding that they won't give special prayer rooms to students uh, in my country, in Kenya, very, very often, the response I get when I test the argument on someone is that they would say, yeah, um, they can move to another place. Um, they, they, they don't have to stay in this place. They can move to another place where they'll be allowed to do that. Uh, and this is not the case just for like public talk. It's actually the case for like laws, people in law itself. So people who, in Carl Clear's words, do legal work um, or people who are studying law. So um, the only way I could make sense of this, um, the only way I could make sense of this by polarism in, in how people see the situation is, all to me, it's an understanding that like, um, that on one end they're dragged by an understanding of a person as a as a as an in, as a an, as an individual, and that their 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 personal flourishing, their individual flourishing, is what matters most. And on the other hand, on the other end, they're dragged by an understanding as of a person as only being a person based on how they are interacting with their communities or with the, the people in their communities. Um, and that the, the freedom matters in on, only insofar as it allows the, the community, people in the community to also flourish. And if it doesn't allow people in the community to also flourish, then it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, because when you look at arguments about like, um, ab about like, um, for example, wearing of the of the of the hijab in a in a in a school setting, um, or how many accommodations basically, what sort of accommodations people deserve, um, then they look very different. I suppose I'm saying in in the West versus how they're received, sorry, how they're received looks very different in the West, very different in the West versus how it's received, um, at least from the interactions I've had um, on online and uh, in person. So I guess uh, that's, that's basically my claim um, that it's a sort of bipolar understanding of what it means to be a person, uh, a bipolar understanding of what it means to be free, um, that is, uh, is coming from a way of life that they're used to. So one way of life that they're used to, uh, basically, uh, as has been fam famously said, um, Africans, many African communities, sorry, were ex extremely communalistic, uh, and many remain so today, um, particularly outside the urban areas. Um, and 
yet there is the Western education and the Western education sort of transforms that understanding. Um, and, and it's like uh, a triple heritage, as Masrui would say, that they have to grapple with. Um, Western ethics, uh, religion, that come that some of which comes from the West, but some of which is is uh, is uh, is indigenous, and their own culture um, itself. And yeah, I guess uh, that's the that's that's what I have to say about this uh, subject. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much to Cecil for his point of view on law and philosophy in Africa. Um, if you have any questions for Cecil, please fill them in in the Mentimeter. Please also make sure that you put his name so we will know at the end who, which questions are for which speakers. Um, I slowly see some questions coming in, so that is great. Uh, so we quickly follow to our next speaker, who is Deepak. Yes, perfect. So Deepak, please. Go ahead. Okay, I'll do a short introduction. So <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay, so Deepak is basically a, a lecturer at Tilburg University. Some of you guys might know him. Um, he specialized in international law and he will tell us more about African co countries and their interactions um, in the global legal field. He will tell us more about treaties, how were African countries treated um, after decolonization with setting up these international treaties, how did these African countries interpret Western law, and what is the dynamic between African countries and uh, the rest of the Western countries uh, in an international law perspective. Thank you. I will just use this. Um, is it possible I can just move this? Yeah, Maybe if that's fine. Okay, thank you um, everyone. So first of all, just a massive thank you to the African Student Association, and in particular Diana and Chinenya for asking me to present today on the topic of origins of African legal thinking. These are really important events to hold, not only just for students to engage with topics and discussions we have in class, but for them to move beyond that and really follow things that you're passionate about and that you want to use your skills and your understanding to really tackle and take on topics that are really key and really important. And also, as I see, I can see some people that are not students, but also for you guys too, to engage with what we are working on as academics. So I'm deeply appreciative of being approached to be here today to speak to you all about this topic from not only an international legal history perspective, and sorry, Cecil, but also from a legal uh, philosophy perspective also. So I'm stepping on your shoes a tad bit. Um, my research has often been a mix of international legal, um, everything okay? Okay. Um, so my, my research has often been a mix of international legal history and legal philosophy, philosophy. So I thought it'd be pertinent to discuss African legal thinking from this vantage point. This is a very significant topic of discussion for me as it represents an important movement that needs to take place across all the academic disciplines namely that of opening the floodgates to a more diverse way of thinking on a cultural and regional basis. This means to not simply dwell on Western thought as the be all and end all of all academic explorations, as it unfortunately has been often the case on so many occasions, but instead to engage on a mainstream level. And for many of you, perhaps not so in tune with the academic discipline, and I would, wouldn't be a surprise if you don't, because we do not do a great job of engaging with the wider public. There is a mainstream uh, within all disciplines. And what I would like to see is non-Western thinking provide new ways of thought and fresh solutions to domestic, regional, and global matters. So rather than this being a simple talk that, I, uh, that just goes through some of the things that I know and researched, I want this to be a call to arms to you all. We need young Africans to help us academics do better. To have African legal scholars that come to the various fields and advance African legal thinking is undeniably important, not only because it is an absolute travesty diverse philosophies that I must profess that I know so little about are talked about so little when we are attempted to answer some of the big global questions. So my talk will take most of its time detailing how international law has fallen short of this, of this and engaged so little with how Africa 
um, has some important roles and, and important vantage points to play. So instead, I'm going to look at how Africa is often seen as a place of conquering and acquisition or as victims to the sword of, in, of the international legal system. Instead of potentially providing a library for new um, ideas and new ways of thinking about international law. So I will start by detailing the origins of what is considered the origins of international law. And that date is usually considered to be 1648. And this is seen as the watershed moment for Jus Gentium, or seen as the law of nations, or what we call today as public international law. Analyzing the genesis of the law of nations, one quickly understands that the catalyst for the law of nations is European in nature. This year, 1648, is historically significant for the Treaty of Westphalia, that ended the 30-year war that is considered one of the most destructive conflicts in European history, uh, lasting from 1618 to 1648. Between 1618 and 1635, the dispute was largely seen as being between the Kingdom of Bohemia and the Habsburgs monarchy, so this phase of the conflict is considered a German civil war. Other parties, such as Sweden or the Spanish Empire, were involved, but nonetheless, the predominant focus is on German members of the Ro Holy Roman Empire. However, the second phase of the war became a wider struggle, including France, the Dutch Republic, Denmark, Norway, along with Sweden and the Spanish Empire. For scholars such as Henry Kissinger, the Peace of Westphalia is seen as the origins of the principles crucial to modern international relations, including the inviolability of borders and the non-interference in the domestic affairs of sovereign states. The Peace of Westphalia envisaged a collective security system which obliged parties to defend its provisions against all others. Disputes were to be referred to a peaceful settlement um, to a legal adjudication process. As mentioned earlier, it becomes quite clear that the origins of international law, with emphasis on international law, is deeply rooted in a European issue. However, there are some challenges to um, 1648 being the origins of international law. In international legal history in particular, uh, there are indications of elements of international law um, taking place in various time points before 1648. For example, some authors start by examining the relations and treaties between political entities from ancient times, so, so starting from 3000 BC, including pre-classical antiquity in the Near East, ancient Greece and Persia, and the Romano-Hellenistic period. But regardless, when we as lecturers introduce international law, to law students or to the wider general public, we tend to focus on 1648 as the origins of international law, which leads to a wider problem of presenting international law as inherently a European or Western phenomenon. Furthermore, in our introductory discussions of international law, there is a tendency to refer to Hugo Grotius, considered the father of international law, as the figure that lay the foundations for the international legal system we have today. We can also know other important international legal scholars during the 16th and 17th century, such as Francesco di Vittoria and Alberto Gentili, um, who similarly helped develop the international legal system. So overall, our introductory exploration maps international law to be Eurocentric, which inevitably underappreciates regional developments in Africa, the Far East, the Islamic world, Latin America, the, the South and Southeast Asia. Um, someone that really developed this idea and supported this argument was R.P. Arnand, who notes that it is incorrect to assume that international law has developed only during the last four or five hundred years, and only in Europe, or that Christian civilization has enjoyed a monopoly in regard to prescription of rules to govern interstate conduct. As Majid Kaduri points out, in each civilization, the population tended to develop within itself a community of political entities, a family of nations, whose interrelationships were reg regulated by a set of practices rather than being a single nation governed by a single authority and a single system of law. Several families of nations existed or coexisted in areas such as the ancient Near East, Greece and Rome, China, Islam and Western Christendom, where at least one distinct civilization had developed in each of them. Within each civilization, a body of principles and rules developed for regulating the conduct of states with one another in peace and war. So this really highlights and annotates the fact that international law isn't a purely Western uh, phenomenon. It's not a purely Western 
um, ideal. There is examples of international law taking place prior to the Eurocentric focus on 1648. So now I want to jump a little forward in the historical timeline of international law and focus in on the 19th century, where it is particularly interesting in, in how hegemonic powers interacted with Africa. During this period, we witnessed a real focus on the differentiation between so-called civilized and non-civilized nation. There was this turn to positivism, a legal philosophy that focuses on conducting law as a science where we don't really engage or interact with political, moral or economic matters. And this turn to positivism during the 19th century facilitated such differentiations between so-called civilized and non-civilized nations. As positivists during this period insisted on separating the civilized from the so-called uncivilized, deeming European law to be greater importance over non-European law. Many positivist writers during the 19th century, such as Henry Wheaton, argue that a different set of rules regulated civilized Europeans and uncivilized non-European nations, with connotations inferring perceptions of superiority. Wheaton argued that, is there a uniform law of nations? There certainly is not the same for one or for all the nations and states of the world. The public law, with slight exceptions, has always been and still is limited to the civilized and Christian people of Europe or to those of European origin. Anthony Angie, a very famous contemporary international legal scholar who helped develop the third world approach to international law, argued that this allowed European powers to dominate the international legal system and how it would be constructed. He argued that it is simply and massively asserted that only the practice of European states was decisive and could create international law. Only European law counted as law. Non-European states were excluded from the realm of law, now identified as being the exclusive preserve of European states, as a result of which the former were deprived of membership and the ability to um, assert any rights um, cognizable as legal. This distinction resulted in the justification of unequal treatment in the international legal system. Non-European nations would be forced to give way to European practices and ambitions. When drawing into Africa during this period, the development of international law paved the way for colonization. In fact, colonial powers' use of international law during their engagement in Africa typifies this notion that international law was regularly utilized or even developed for the sake of imperialist ambitions. Examining Britain's interaction with West African polities, the former utilized treaties to acquire more land in the West African region. Treaties were concluded by British imperial agents with West African leaders on the premise of commercial privileges, the preservation of peace, the abolition of the slave trade, or other humanitarian inspired reasons, paving the way for inserting clauses that provided for the transfer of partial or complete territorial sovereignty. This strategy is evident when exploring Thomas Buxton's The African Slave Trade and its Remedy, where he recounts how African leaders were incentivized to abolish the slave trade and to cede portions of their land for commercial expansionism through the conclusion of these treaties. Furthermore, through the acquisition of land, um, sorry, though the acquisition of land should be considered the separate, um, separate to the acquisition of private property rights and, and rights and land, the treaties concluded with African communities made illegal encroachments on the land rights of such communities. Such encroachments highlighted that the use of international law in regulating relationships in West Africa had been to the benefit of British interests as various Western doctrines were selectively incorporated into 19th century model of international law for the sake of colonial ambitions. No more is such a phenom phenomenon more apparent then when during the 19th century imperialistic age, yet another category was introduced in the international legal doctrine, namely territorium nullius. While terra nullius signified empty lands, territorium nullius indicated lands devoid of sovereign control by Western states. So ultimately, what we see when engaging with the history of international law is that either, either Africa has been largely excluded from the establishing of the international legal framework or it has been an avenue for expansionist policies for the more powerful states. In rounding up my talk, I want to refer to my um, book, States Undermining International Law. Yes, I understand that that is a very shameless plug, but I promise you that it is relevant. 
In, in my book, I developed the term emancipatory idealism. Put simply, emancipatory idealism is the idea that the protection of individuals, oh, sorry there, um, of individuals and communities from wars and acts of oppression is of paramount importance in order to prevent the decline of civilization and to ensure that its development continues. The base idea is that each individual, a community of individuals, has the potential to provide um, civilizational development on either a sociological or technological level if provided the stable economic, legal, political, or societal environment. I believe that this is hugely pertinent for when we talk about African legal thinking and how the greater prominence of such thought can foster civilizational development. I would like to see international law be truly international by incorporating non-Western ideas so that a legal system designed to maintain international peace and security does not continue the traditions and thinking of a select few. So I'd like to make a request to you all I want you to engage with international law and implement African thinking to the discipline so that we can redefine the international legal system to perhaps pose a more truly global outlook. I understand that it is a very bold statement to request such a revolutionary rethinking of international law, but if we really want a truly international legal system, then it is imperative that this movement takes place. Thank you all for your time. Yes, so thank you so much, Deepak, for your uh, point of view on international law in Africa. So again, if you have any questions for Deepak, please uh, fill them in in the Mentimeter. You can scan the QR code or fill in the numbers down below on menti.com. Um, our next speaker will be Aurelia. Aurelia, welcome. So Aurelia is an international uh, European law graduate. She specialized in business and human uh, rights, human rights law. So human rights, human rights are basically the basic human rights for all afforded to everyone. However, she will tell us more about how these human rights may be different from the rights exercised in Africa, and she will give her point of view on that. Um, yeah, I think this is better, yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'll just reintroduce myself. Uh, my name is Aurelia. I am an LLM graduate from Maastricht University, so quite recently in such a setup. But um, what makes me stand out is I call myself the Pismatic Queen in the sense that I love to question um, different dynamics and what they look like. And when Diana um, approached me with the idea um, that we have to start thinking from an African legal perspective. I was very happy because this has been the sort of dilemma that I went, I, I experienced as well, uh, having moved here for my uh, bachelor's and my master's as well. We are constantly quoting Western um, authors and sometimes it gets you thinking like, hmm, what does this look like from an African perspective? If we are the cradle of mankind, hey Kenyans in the house, <laughs> don't you think that we also have a little bit of perspective of what law looks like? And why is it that we are just focusing on the legal scholars, you know, uh, from the Western world in that sense? So um, today I'm going to look at. Um, the origin of African legal thinking, not from a historical point. I will shy away from that a little bit. Um, I will look at it from the human rights perspective because I think normally, like you've mentioned with international law, there is a bit of a seg segmented view that certain rights apply on a different angle and human rights are on the other side. But as a human rights lawyer, I would say that human rights should be the start and finish of all legal thinking. So I will start from there. Um, and I will further come up what every argument is coming from the assumption that um, human rights in that sense or the origin of human rights is inherently Eurocentric. Sorry if you have a different opinion, uh, but I'm, I am 
actually deducing from that assumption, and then we are going to break down uh, what that looks like. So um, hopefully this discussion will provide a guidance on you know, what is considered doom and gloom in that sense. So we have a problem, human rights being inherently Eurocentric, and we are trying to come up with solution of sort of so solutions or a way forward to it. Um, quick question, or just engage with me a little bit. When we talk about human rights, um, what human rights in Africa, what comes to your mind? Just shout out if you can, quick one. So basically, or what I was looking for, <laughs> <laughs> which has been captured is there's this general idea when we talk about Africa and human rights, majority of just the, the thought process of most people come from a violation of human rights uh, perspective rather than the right based. But when you come, when you look at the European way of thinking when it comes to human rights, it is more of right based approach as a as opposed to violation-based approach. So then there's this idea that Africa is the worst violator of human rights. Um, um, yeah, and that sometimes is captured in uh, legal thinking. Uh, it is captured in blogs, in news, CNN, fake news, all that, which to a certain degree is true. Anyway. Today, I will be looking at three areas, and that is the awareness of Eurocentrism in African legal system, the shift from Eurocentric approach of human rights and breaking away from a Eurocentric approach. So that the breaking away will sort of give us a guidance on what could potentially be a way forward for, from the doom and gloom. Like I said, I will not go deeply into the historical development, um, but what I always like to put as a disclaimer is that um, even though we are talking about uh, human rights, the manifestation of Eurocentric ideologies is in application enforcement and justiciability of human rights norms should not be used to dismantle the universal need of human rights. So this is to say that we are not going to say just because it's Eurocentric, we don't need human rights. I think there is a sweet spot that we all need to look for as legal scholars and not really look at it from a point that it is no longer good just because it is Eurocentric. Um, and sometimes Eurocentrism awareness should be used as a, a tool to reflect on the formulation and the future of human rights. And that is part of what we will explore. So then um, I will start by, give me just one second. Yes, so I will go into the um, awareness of Eurocentric approach in African legal thinking. When I had this topic, I was thinking of what, what is bringing a, a bit of an awareness to people it's setups, setups like this when you are looking at the history of human rights, for instance, there was a historical dominant ideology of human rights in the sense that um, initially uh, civil and political rights were very much prioritized over economic, social, and cultural rights as it is within the Eurocentric right, because around that time, it was very important uh, after the World War to define, um, to define the political rights. And this was sort of the historical uh, development of human rights. So then the focus has been so much so um, uh, civil and political rights. And this, this creates a disconnect uh, with sort of other regions. And when I say, let, let me talk of Africa and maybe a bit of Asia and other regions of the world because the way culturally we are set up, we cul culturally, economically, we sort of end up having a different priority. And then um, there was a hyper-focus in unity of human rights norms while ignoring the plurality <laughs> approach. And um, this, is, this is just to say that 
the focus was to make sure that the whole world had a set of human rights norms that we were working with. And that in and of itself is not a problem, but it made, it's, it came from an assumption that as the world, we were all struggling from similar set of um, human rights problems. And the plurality on the other end will be um, to look at different elements, different angles of uh, human rights problems, and then collectively work towards unity. So you start from the plural nature uh, of different areas, regions of the world, uh, Africa, Asia, Europe, America, and then slowly work towards bringing all the rights together. So there has been a focus in first uniting and then fixing the little problems and sometimes that creates a further disconnect. Um, and this again brings the awareness because the driving, the driving, the drivers of unity are more Euro Eurocentric in that sense. Yeah. Um, and then there is arbitrary, arbitrary judgment of non-compliance of human rights. And this sometimes comes from uh, review uh, mechanisms such as the periodic review, where I have been able to participate in one of the periodic reviews and it felt like being called out the entire session is more of uh, the biggest violators. That is why I asked the first question is the biggest violators of human rights. And it is constantly saying in terms of um, be it social and political or uh, so, uh, social, civil and political, social and economic rights, eventually it's like Africa is the biggest violator. And then out of these discussions, there are no, when I say arbitrary judgment is there are no way forwards or um, strategic solutions towards the, the lack of compliance. So this is not to say that there is compliance per se and it is not um, properly reported upon. This is to say that there is lack of compliance, but it does not address the root of the problem. And then the last part will be contrasting human rights priorities. And this is what I, I, I sort of touched upon in the first historical dominance. Um, and when you talk about contrasting human rights priorities is this, because of the dominant ideologies, um, there, might, there are certain rights that are more focused upon and the priorities of continents such as Africa and Asia are left not necessarily being targeted in that sense. Uh, there are no solutions or if there are solutions, they're not at the top of the priority in um, human rights platforms. Um, so then we've, we've, I've sort of touched base on what has been causing the awareness, the, the disconnect, and I will also further look into the factors that are influencing the shift from a Eurocentric approach to human, um, approach of human rights. So the first thing I will say is um, globalization of human rights. And by globalization, I also, globalization and development of human rights. The more we are talking about human rights, um, the more we are breaking through the different forms of rights, be it social uh, and economic rights or civil and political, the more it is developing as a discipline. And most people are, are now trying to come up, are, are having a better understanding of um, what is more Eurocentric versus what is a necessity or an approach that could work better in other areas. Um, there's, um, this is very controversial, but um, there has been tendencies, I, would, I say 
I said what I said. <laughs> there has been net tendencies of uh, neocolonialism through human rights in the sense that uh, human rights violation has been used as a tool to drive political policies, um, neocolonial strategies, um, while perpetuating injustices in other instances where human rights, the violation itself is, is reduced to the, let's say, African actors, while the finances are uh, different, are probably, for instance, from America or from Europe, but they are not seen as violators per se. Um, so that has been one of that, that element of domination in the conversation of violation has been one of those elements that have uh, factors that have influenced the shift. And then um, there's the Afrocentric human rights defenders. And by human rights defenders, I mean um, people like Diana, <laughs> people like me, uh, lawyers, judges, uh, civil society, because up, up until recently, human rights was more, the, the driving factors were very Eurocentric in that nature, but because of development, because of, you know, um, the idea of dominance and trying to balance up, out the power and information as well, uh, more human rights defenders are looking at human rights from a very Afrocentric, uh, African-centered solution. Area, so I would think those. I think those are some of the factors influence, influencing the shift. Um, there's the African-centered judicial and human rights institution, and these ones are regional and national as well, such as the African Court of Justice, um, African Court of Peoples and Human Rights. And what I wanted to highlight with this, again, I had an opportunity of uh, interning with the African Court, and. Even during our stay there, we were encouraged to look at certain research from a very African-centric perspective in a way that it would work. For instance, if you're dealing with um, uh, what is it called? Yeah, the, uh, not not per se right to life, but uh, right to fair trial. We were trying to really look into what does it look like from an um, African perspective, considering that um, when you bring a case to the African court, there are certain um, issues that might influence, such as uh, governance, in, that might influence the case in that sense, and you know, political protection and all that. That is not really a Eurocentric problem, if you think about it in the strict sense, but from an African perspective, that is something that we had to think. So these centers um, or other organizations such as the African Commission of People and Human Rights, they're really central to uh, influencing the shift. And, and then again, I will say contrasting human rights priorities, we are getting to a place where we are more developed, we understand the dynamics, but we are trying to come up with, inf with the, the priorities sort of differ. Are, and it, it comes from the idea that Africa is not, you know, it's not a homogeneous, we don't have a homogeneous problem and different areas need different, have different priorities. Certain areas are more in need of civil and political protection of human rights and other areas are seeking or are striving for more economical, uh, social and cultural rights. And then finally, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. African legal scholars. Um, so the last part is just to break down what could be the solution. So have African legal scholars or legal professionals been um, a driving factor towards the breaking away of Eurocentrism, yes. Um, how do they do that? Inter interdisciplinary uh, thought leadership, so that is uh, scholarly work, legal precedents, and this is where I also encourage people to, if you're a blogger and you have 
Daniel Research published that. I know social media now is also another driving factor um, as opposed to what was considered uh, legal scholarly work. So there is need for innovation, legal creativity uh, from non-progressive practices, example naming and shaming that happens during uh, periodic reviews. It, it, is, it has been established that well, I will be ashamed, but not for long. So <laughs> we need to work on better mechanisms that help uh, drive uh, human rights. And then transparently redefining African compliance of human rights and self-determination and global participation. So in conclusion, we need people like you and me to drive, <laughs> yeah, um, African narrative of what human rights looks like and not just human rights but other legal ideologies as well. Thank you. <laughs> yes, so thank you so much Aurelia for your point of view on human rights in Africa. Again, if you have any questions for Aurelia, please feel free uh, to ask them. If you prefer to ask them live, uh, afterwards we will walk around with the mic and you can ask them live as well. Um, so I would like to welcome our next uh, speaker, Rekana. So Rekana has an ext extensive background in law and technology. Uh, she currently works as a data protection officer at Doctors Without Borders. And she will tell us more about how different legal practices in Africa from the West. And she will particularly give us a Nigerian account for this. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank the organizers of this event, African Student Association of Tilburg University. I'm very, very inspired by what you're doing and by the talk we've had so far and all the speakers that have come before me. Um, so my name is Rekana Isong. I'm, uh, I'm a legal practitioner. I'm called to the Nigerian Bar since um, 2005. And my contribution to the conversation today is um, basically to talk about the practical realities of, of legal practice of law, the legal profession in Africa, particularly in Nigeria. Um, I'm going to be painting a picture of what is, maybe a little bit of background of how we got here, what is, and maybe hopefully from young bright minds like you, um, discover how we can move forward um, and take the legal profession um, yeah, to be more impactful to everyday life in, in Africa. So just to paint, uh, uh, give a, a little background overview, especially, particularly, like I said, from the Nigerian perspective, um, you, the legal profession is very much um, in a, would I say there are two aspects to it. There, there's the African legal uh, philosophy, African body of legal ideas and rules and traditions that we follow. And that is um, under the customary law aspects of the of law. And then we have the um, westernized legal system that came to us as a, as a result of um, colonialism. So that also exists on the other side. But there is kind of like a hierarchy. Um, unfortunately, with the legacy of colonialism, it means in, inadvertently or as a, you know, directly as a result, the customary law is subservient to the, like, what, at least in Nigeria, common law, or the constitutional law and, and other stuff like that. And we try, or we try to see how we can bring the two together. Um, so the customary law exists um, where, yeah, we, if you have disputes with your neighbors, you go there because we have a saying that when you take your brother to court, and as speakers before us, before me have said, Africa, we have a communal understanding of who a person is. Um, so we have the saying that when you take your brother to court, you don't come back as brothers anymore. And by that, we mean the Western court. Um, we don't mean the customary court. The customary court, you can still go there and come back as brothers. But the hierarchy exists in such a way that if you do not agree with, or there's still some further disputes, between the customary court's decision and the Western court's decision, then the Western court's decision will supersede. So it's always like the customary court is lower and then the, the, the Western court is higher. And, and one problem also, or one issue that causes a bit of disconnect, and I, I, 
just before I get there, I, will, I, I became a lawyer like most African people become lawyers because your parents make you to become lawyers. <laughs> so you're either gonna be a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer. So those are the three options you have, nothing else, or you're a disgrace to your family and to the whole community. <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and I know that, that the law, and I guess all of us here in this room, understand the power and the impact that the law, that the law can have in, in, in shaping society, in bringing about peace and prosperity and progress to, to, to a people. Um, but the difficulty there is that when the law is superimposed on you and the language of the court is English, the language of the court is English language, and although English language is the, is the official language, not everybody in Nigeria speaks English. Um, so how, does, how do you make use of the law? How does the everyday person know how valuable it can be, what a useful tool it is to uplift their lives when they cannot even speak the language of the law? That is maybe a question that we can um, see and explore and find ways to solve it. So you become a lawyer because your parents make you. You go to university in Nigeria. You do undergraduate for um, five years. I'm trying to pick it, paint the picture of actual, yeah, you're a lawyer in Nigeria. What does that mean? How do you get there? I mean, it's five-year bachelor's. And then when you finish your bachelor's, you will go to the Nigerian law school. And Nigerian law school is for one year. Uh, after one year, you write exam, you're called to bar, you pass the exam, and then push, you're out to the wilder world, go and be a lawyer. Um, it's, it's very challenging, it's very, um, it's hard, it's hard. Um, young lawyers in Nigeria, um, if you want to get rich as a lawyer, you will, eventually, but not at the beginning. So you really need a lot of financial support, you need a lot of financial aid, um, you really must love what you do, and you really must have people that, that support and back you up, which also in, in unfortunately perpetuates the elitism of, of the legal profession of, of law. And the language is English, and then you have to be of, um, yeah, you have to have some financial um, wherewithal to be able to study the, you know, study the, 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 to do the career and then practice law before you're able to take care of yourself and your family, which is the duty of every African person. You don't just take care of yourself, you take care of everybody else. You need at least five years in the profession at the bare minimum for you to be at a place where, okay, I can now feed myself and feed my parents, feed my, you know, stuff like that. Um, so it's, 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 it's a lot of work. Um, there are a lot of challenges also um, with regards to um, when you come with, with these ideas, or you know, you're a lawyer now, you want to change the world, you want to take over and, you know, do good things, and then you're, you're hit with the reality that, um, yeah, maybe it's not as, as uh, maybe justice is not maybe the picture that I thought justice was. You have to manage your expectations. Um, we hope and we, 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 we are, you know, we, we hope that we can have a judiciary where yeah, that is actually free from influence, but that is not always the case. There are some cases that you that you are involved in and you do, and you know that, yeah, you did not really get justice, at least not in the way that you, as what you think, or what justice ought to be, right? Um, and sometimes also, it may not necessarily be, um, may not necessarily be all negative. I think our judges need to be encouraged to be creative in their solutions. Um, not everything copy paste from from uh, yeah from the common law system. Not everything's applicable. We should find as the speaker before me. Um, I'm sorry, you have such a beautiful name. <laughs> Aurelia, yeah, Aurelia, yeah. Said we should have find a happy medium between um, what you know the Western way and our way, and what what the happy yeah what 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 we can do, what solutions that we can bring. Not necessarily sticking to the past in terms of our customer traditions, which are valuable, but you know coming forward also, but not in necessarily, you know, copy pasting everything the way it's quote unquote supposed to be. If it's not practical, if it's not useful to everyday life, what is the value of your? What's the value of the judgment? What's the value of the law? Yeah, what's the value to to everyday people? Um, so when you you argue your cases, and one one thing you quickly quickly realize that yeah, this law is not is not an African is not an African at least the law in terms of the Western law that we practice when you go to school and all that. 
um, is the, the outfits that we wear. I don't know if you guys know, but <laughs> you are in Africa, you are in the hot sun, it's 35 degrees, 37 degrees, maybe even 40 degrees, and you are wearing all the things that, you know, that your British overlord said you should wear to be a proper lawyer. You're wearing a heavy suit, you're wearing your wig, you're wearing your gown. It is hot. It is very hot. And there are lots of um, conversations about whether or not we still need to hang on to those things, right? Um, yeah, it's part of this, the reality that, yeah, this is not something that we would have thought about on our own. But, yeah, but it's, it, it is what it is. Um, um, but, yeah, the, in Nigeria especially, lawyers are very, very um, useful. Lawyers, um, are especially human rights lawyers, they've, they, they are very bold, very courageous. They challenge decisions and a lot of um, freedoms that we have. We have freedoms that are in the constitution, in the text, but they don't come to life unless... Um, unless everyday lawyers take those kind of cases, take hard cases to court and challenge them and say, what does this mean? In practice, what does it mean for me? What does it really mean? Or you have the right to property, right? For example, you have the right to own your property, but then you have um, corrupt police, corrupt government, they come and seize your property and, you know, seize your, you know, put you in prison unjustly. And then you go to court and you challenge that. And then there's a judgment and they say, no, you cannot do this unless you do blah, 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 blah. And then people now know because of the notoriety of it. And they know that, yeah, they, you know, they can, they, can, they can also enforce their own rights and they can also um, use the law to, to, to safeguard um, themselves and, and, their, and, and their communities. So, yeah, um, yeah, there are many branches, many aspects that you can use your, your law degree for. You guys are well aware of that. You can... Um, we have like we have one system. We do not have a by like the way they, they in the UK they have two systems: solicitor or, or, or barrister. In Nigeria, it's together. Maybe the same with some other countries too. Um, but when you actually go out, when they push you out into the world, then you can decide for yourself which area of um, law you want to focus on. Um, you can join a law firm. You can decide to um, be a public prosecutor or defender in the Ministry of Justice. You can go into academia. You can go to the judiciary. So there are many, there are many avenues. Um, some are more open than others. Some are more fair than others. But you can carve a space for yourself, and um, you can be encouraged as young African lawyers or young African law students that that the future is bright for you. Um, yeah, and that you can use your education to to improve your life and improve the life of your family and improve the life of your community, and. Um, more, now more than ever, African voices are, we are using them, we are using our voices, we are speaking up, we are saying, yeah, it doesn't have to, everything doesn't always have to be seen from one lens, and maybe look at it also from our point of view, and from our, um, from our perspective. So yeah, that is basically what I came here to say today. Um, the legal profession is good, it's fun, even when your parents make you to do it, they are your parents for a reason, and your parents know everything. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so much, Rekina, for your insights on the practical um, matter of practicing law in Nigeria. So again, if you have any questions for Rekina, please feel free to ask them. Um, now we'll have a short Q&A session, a short panel discussion uh, about the topics we discussed today. Um, I would like to ask my speakers, I hope Cecil is still online, um, I would like to ask my speakers to come forward. We will set up a few chairs here for you to sit down and we will, uh, we will, uh, you will have the chance to answer all the questions. Uh, Diana will walk around in the public if you have any questions you would like to elaborate on or if you prefer to ask your question live. Diana will be walking around with a mic um, and I will be here um, giving the questions that were mentioned in the Mentimeter. Still feel free to give any questions. I hope we'll have the chance to answer them all. Okay, so I have a first question uh, specifically, specifically for everyone, which is, is an increase of international law in private and public law desired from an African perspective? I Can like I how it? I've just yeah. been, <laughs> uh, I've just been given the uh, microphone straight away there. Um, so I would say yes, I mean, it just falls in line um, in terms of what I was talking about earlier, in terms of international laws foundations are so Western, 
So I think that expansion is needed and that rethinking is needed. We need to incorporate not just African uh, perspectives, but just generally non-Western perspectives. So I think on my perspective, I think we do need that expansion, um, that rethinking and reworking of both private international law and public international law. Because oftentimes when we're dealing with issues, we're dealing with problems, we're applying law, we, we are kind of focused on what's kind of the European approach or what's the Western ambitions and aims and then you know non-western ambitions are kind of fallen to the wayside because of the structure so again uh, Aurelio mentioned and talked about human rights human rights is so western focused and that needs that expansion so our goals and aims and understandings of how to actually have a more universal human rights is perhaps more applicable I will hand over to I'll repeat the question. The question was, is an increase of international law in private and public law desired from an African perspective? Is an increase of international law yeah. in private and public law desired from an African perspective? Desired. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's need. There's a uh, need for that because the idea, the the idea behind any legal um, perspective or any law is to in is to be non-discriminatory. Uh, and to be inclusive. So if we do not look at it from not only an African perspective, but from a, a very uh, worldwide perspective, we are going to start losing the legitimacy of any kind of international law, be it human rights, um, public international law as well. So in order to maintain the integrity of the law, it is important that we start looking at it from different lenses. And not just regional lenses, but also um, in terms of um, racial lens and gender-based lens. So there is need for a wider application of these areas of law. I'll first start by saying that I'm not an expert on international law, um, but as an African, as an observer, I would say absolutely it's very much desired, very much needed. I think um, it's it's the way it's structured right now. Um, for example, I will just say the the United Nations, um, what I say most impactful. Um, arm, the UN Security Council, there's no African representative there, there's no African voice there. Uh, when you look at the, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, um, yeah, a lot of their judgments and their cases are against African leaders. Um, that is not to say, from my perspective, I will say, that it's African leaders alone that are being guilty of um, some of these offenses or, or crimes that they are standing trial for, they've been convicted for. And I'm not saying that when African leaders do the wrong thing that they should not stand justice. I'm saying that it should not only be African leaders that should stand justice. So yeah, absolutely, from my point of view, it's very much needed. Um, our voices should be heard at the UN Security Council, um, the way the international courts are structured, um, we should we should see justice there, so that we feel like it's yeah we are participatory and we're not just the the um, the bad example. You know, we should not only be the bad example of what not to do. Um, yeah, I think bad behavior happens all over in the world also, and we see that. So when it happens, they should also be called out with the same strength, with the same force, with the same um, energy as they come after African. African um, bad actors also. That's from my personal point of view. I don't represent any <laughs> anybody here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, interesting. Um, so Aurelia, you just mentioned inclusivity and regional differences. Um, I would like to come back with that with another question. So considering the regional diverse needs and priorities in different places in Africa, are universal, are universal, are universal human rights desired or would they make sense? Yes, they do make sense. Um, they make sense in terms of uh, providing the rights that 
um, can be justiciable, that can be uh, brought before a court, they provide the right to, um, the right that people can depend on. Um, the only thing is we need, again, um, to make sure that in its application, because the right, the, if you look at any law, specifically also human rights, the right itself has never been the problem. The problem is the application of the, of the right. So what is the application and what is the effect of the right? So um, for instance, we can talk about things like right to housing and in, a, in, an, in and of itself, it is something that can, we can say it's a worldwide a right, but it might not apply to, for instance, nomadic communities. So what, what is needed is more of um, universal, not a universal application, but more of a strategic application of those universal rights. Mm -hmm. So the rights don't have a problem, the application sometimes is the problem. Okay, perfect. So then I have a question for Deepak. In which ways do you yourself envisage international law being truly internationalized? Um, so I think from a, I'm going to talk about it from an academic perspective, but having non-Western academics not have to bring their work forward in relation to Western thought. So oftentimes what we do see in conferences and in discussions or even papers that in order to get published or in order to get into these conferences, you have, they have to compare and contrast uh, to uh, Western thinking or Western perspectives. And I think that's one avenue where if you are going to talk about West, um, non-Western perspectives, that you don't have to talk about Kant or, or um, Hegel or any of those figures. You can go straight into that discussion because then the whole discussion about non-Western thought isn't necessarily about that, but comparing and contrasting. So I think to have a more truly international, um, at least scholarly debate, it's allowing these um, perspectives and allowing these um, scholars to talk about it without this pressure of um, having to discuss Western legal thought. I, I remember being in a conference um, and there was a Japanese scholar who says, in, in order for me to get into a conference, in order for me to get my papers published, I have to mention Western legal thought. And that's a real problem. So we're not really having non-Western legal thought be in the mainstream. It's kind of this, this spicy, interesting, exotic thing that we get to look at if we've got time but it isn't kind of the main focus. And I think that's where international law, from a scholarly perspective at least, can be a bit more international. Okay, perfect. Um, in the meantime, are there any uh, live questions? Okay, then I'll have a question for Rekana. Uh, what advice would you give someone who wants to work in tech law in Africa? I would say go for it. Um, it's the, the it, yeah it's it's um i think africa has one of the fastest growing um internet users technology hubs so absolutely go for it um yeah be yeah the sky is your limit really it's very much um an area of law that as far as law is concerned even here in the west it's a relatively new area of law right we're not talking about land law or human rights law that have hundreds and hundreds of years of of um, legal experience behind it. Um, technology law is very much um, still a green field and there's lots of space and there's lots of opportunities and I would say absolutely go for it, be fearless and do your thing. Okay, very inspiring. Uh, would you mind if I ask a question? Yes, of course. Okay, so this is for Rakana. Um, how would you say the dynamics that you described, so a discrepancy between law being seen as an elitist, mostly English-based um, tool versus society's perception of um, what the law is in Nigeria, how would you say that dynamic plays into data protection law? Do you think many, um, let's say, businesses are willing to take claims to courts or is the, does the perception still hold? Um. I think businesses do not have a lot of the disconnect, but the disconnect is more with individuals, with pe with persons, right? And by businesses, I'm not talking of, uh, you know, sole proprietorship, one person business, I mean like, you know, a company, quote unquote. I think I think they are very much um, aware and they, they exercise their rights. They know how to 
navigate the legal system because actually they can afford <laughs> they can afford they can afford the legal expense the disconnect is more with with the everyday person um yeah to even being aware of what their rights are because again the law is in english it's um it's written in english it's explained in english even when they take their claims to court and they want to say something they will need to um, get an interpreter which may be difficult to to uh, to, to get so it's the struggle is with the everyday person. It's not necessarily with, with um, yeah, with companies or with corporations, and that's where it's unfortunate because most people in Africa, do kind of, yeah, are not uh, company owners and are not part of corporations. They're everyday ordinary people, and we need to bridge that gap and make the law accessible to everyone. Hmm. So nice that answer. Thank you. Okay, for Rekana again, I'd like to continue on what you just said. So, do you then think that? African lawyers have a better chance of making a different difference inside of Africa or outside? Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think the, the rigors that um, being an African lawyer brings, or oh, yeah, this, this, I think if you can succeed in Africa, you can succeed anywhere because it's not easy at all. And I'm not saying it's easy anywhere else, but it, if it's not easy here, then it's much, much, much more difficult in Africa, um, yeah, the conditions for study are yeah very. It's very hard. It's very hard. So if you can persevere, if you can pull through, um, yeah, you stay humble when you come. You know, when you come to the West, then then yeah, you can you can you 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 can hold your ground and stand your ground with anybody. You should not feel less than. You should not feel or inadequate in any way if you're here then you are the same like everybody else and there's space for you and there's room for you and you can grow um you can grow and yeah you can hold your own and it opens up your mind because when you're in conversations you're in discussions even at work or in school people are interested to hear your point of view and you come with a perspective that maybe they do not have and they haven't considered you know because of your african background so you hear that point of view and you share yours also yeah um that's, there's, there's nothing stopping you from stopping an African lawyer, African student from, yeah, reaching, reaching for the sky. Nothing at all. Okay, very well. Um, in the meantime, are there any questions from the audience? Diana? <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Are there a country, other countries or regions in the world where you can learn from? Because your philosophical system or philosophical system in Africa is like Ubuntu is you are only a human in relation to other humans so body and soul are one and in the West body and soul are separate so that's a big difference in other regions there are philosophical systems that seems more like that of Africa so I think, for instance, of Buddhism, where also body and soul are one. So can you learn from other countries like India or China or some other regions in the world to improve the legal system in Africa? Yeah, I, I, I like where you're going with that because, yeah, there are areas for instance when i when you think about mainstreaming of african ideologies um buddhism is something that is widely spoken about and it's of course done by uh, the buddhist them themselves but we find that as much as african uh, religious ideologies or cultural ideologies were considered primitive in that nature so was it done in areas like uh, Asia. So it is upon us, of course, to also start mainstreaming our ideas. And the best way to do that is not to depend, first of all, with uh, to highly depend on the scholars, be it legal, be it cultural, be it the interdisciplinary uh, areas where maybe culture meets religion and law. But uh, the best way to do that is also start be be creative and i i am also feeling the need to I, to address that i know not everyone here is african but there is 
Friends of Africa, a concept called Friends of Africa. That's what I call anyone who is affiliated to Africa in that sense. So there are also Friends of Africa who are allies as well. So there is need for collaboration that will also drive to the mainstreaming of African ideologies, such as bringing Ubuntu to light and other concepts that are in a way still bringing togetherness and unity, th which basically that is what the law is trying to do. Um, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of different ways to look at that in terms of looking at um, how different legal systems can provide different solutions. I think uh, the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission in South Africa is a great example of that, being innovative and thinking about how to actually uh, heal the wounds of a regime that had caused so much destruction. So I think absolutely, and I think uh, one way in which uh, not just kind of African philosophies, but non-Western philosophies overall can really contribute is this idea of uh, the community over the individual. I think that's something that's really necessary and essential about talking about how human rights can then be enacted and can be applied in a more applicable manner. So, yeah, I definitely think, you know, appreciating how these different philosophies view uh, the world and have those different perspectives can just enrich in um, how the international legal system or how we see law um, as a whole. Um, yes, um, I think, I think um, absolutely we can, we can learn a lot from, from, from uh, especially the, of course, we, we already are very familiar, I would say, with, with Western legal thoughts in Africa. Um, but we can also very much learn from, from, from Asia. And one thing I really admire about um, um, the Asia, uh, about Asia, especially, I would say, India, because I think to a large degree, they have similar history with Nigeria and but lots of Africa. But one thing I really admire about that is that um, unlike what we did a lot in Africa, we did not just... Um, they held on very greatly to a lot of their, their, yeah, their cultures, their traditions, their religion, and did not jettison it so quickly because of the new thing that had come. And they find found a way to to have both side by side, and maybe that is testament to why they are doing a little bit better than than Africa is doing. I think we can learn from that. We have our values, and our values are valuable. We can also learn from others, um, um, from other cultures and other, you know, systems and see what we can learn from that and add and feed into us without, you know, throwing everything away that we have or because we now want to adopt this next new thing, but see what fits within us and what sits within us as, as Africans and be proud of our, ourselves, but also, yeah, learn from where we can and add to, our, to ourselves and grow collectively. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a question that um, connects to that. Uh, it might be difficult for you to answer, but I'm just going to ask it. <laughs> so it's a question for everyone. Um, in what ways do you see the field, the field of psychology or sociology contributing to African legal systems? Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, that is difficult. Um, I'm going to hand it over to really. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you more thinking time. Yeah? Psychology, sociology. This. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to process. <laughs> um, I think the, the first approach is to honor interdisciplinary um, norms that we get from psychology because to basically, as a lawyer, for instance, criminal law, you always have to think to a greater extent what, in terms of psychological um, uh, approach. Or, so in, in a way, I will see it as any other interdisciplinary um, field that provides or shine lights. It, it, the, in the past, we have always looked at different disciplines as interdependent as independent, but now we need to start looking at the, any discipline, be it religion, psychology, sociology, everything is connected. And I know I sound like a unicorn lover right now, and I am, um, but everything is very much interconnected. And based on that, 
we have to start looking. When I say I am a psychmatic queen is because I always try and connect what everything could lead towards a, a particular topic. And lawyers were known to be very much um, practical in that nature. But I think the world is developing to an area where we have to start embracing other disciplines that will help us um, not only spread the law, but also understand the law on a deeper level. I hope I've answered the question. Um, what's particularly bad about me just dodging that question was <clears throat> I've just taught a few of you a few hours ago about this topic. So for me to draw a blank like that is pretty horrendous. So, um, so yeah, well, I'm, I'm just re renditioning what I've just taught some of you guys. So um, it's really important to actually look at kind of social or legal approaches to law. So to understand how certain laws come about and how certain laws are developed, how legislation is developed. And that psychological understanding, those kind of cultural and, and political underpinnings that develop or, or decide those choices that are made are really important. So, yeah, I think, you know, looking at how um, certain cultural norms are, are prevalent within one society are essential because it helps you understand how certain legal practices come about. Why do certain legislation, why certain legislation developed um, in the way it is because of those historical lineages. So, for example, let's look at um, India, how it's moved from a common law system because of um, that I impact of the British Empire and things like that. So you understand that development. So I think psychology is one of those aspects in terms of understanding why we get the laws and the legislation that we do. And I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything they say, I stand by it. <laughs> okay. I said to, we have a question in the back. Let's yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I grew up in a very Nigerian household. Like, it, there was no democracy. It felt like a, <laughs> a dictatorship kind of thing. So I was also very much pressured into studying law or medicine. So that is very true. We settled on psychology at the end. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess my question is for us that did not take the legal route or are not in that field, but still like want to have an impact and see what's going on in their home countries and are well not happy with what's happening, but are not in that space to make an impact so powerful. How how can we still be helpful in a way? I feel like this is a more approach to you guys to answer. Um, I don't know one very good question, really very good question. So you are you know, you corroborate what I said, your parents make you do stuff. So I'm happy, uh, yeah, somebody in the audience agrees. Um, I don't want, you know, you or anyone else to think that, um, at least that we are saying that the only way you can contribute is through the legal profession. And the reason why we made a, at least the reason why I made my talk so legal centric is because of the topic today, right? They are, Africa is in need of um, a lot and Law is just one way in which in which we can achieve something. Um, um, there are many ways, there are many paths, and today, especially with with um, with um, how, yeah, with with the possibility of influencing people a lot in terms of the use of social media that lots of young people are engaged in. Um, yes, the, you can you can make a lot of impact. You can have your voice heard. You don't even have to be in Nigeria to speak to Nigerians. Um, yeah, they are, find a space, find a niche. There are lots of um, um, humanitarian organizations, lots of NGOs, lots of groups, many, many avenues in which voices can be heard. And Nigeria is not just, or Africa is not just, oh, this is the way in which we want to go. All voices on the table, all perspectives are welcome. And a lot of disciplines, you know, feed off of each other, feed off of each other, so yeah. Um, sociology, psychology, law, the sciences, everything is interconnected. And today's talk was just about law because we are, you know, kind of focusing on that today. But that is not to say at all that that is the one way and the best way or the only way. Not at all. It's just one way. There are many, many parts to 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 helping us achieve the Africa that would we want to see. Uh, what's your name? 
blessing. Uh, you're an expert in your own right, simply because uh, your, your life experiences have led you to where you are right now. So for anyone who sits and doubts if they are able to make an impact, just know that whatever life experience has thrown at you has made you an expert. So at least that's what I tell myself every day when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> but I understand sometimes uh, in such platforms or when you are in a culture that magnifies certain areas, even within the law, some of us are considered, for lack of a better word, trash. Um, <laughs> so um, you have to define for yourself what success looks like. And that is outside of what what is mainstreamed in that sense and that will allow you when you define what success looks like to you it will allow you room for creativity and it will it will make you be part of a solution the world needs more solution than um big names you know than the lawyers and the doctors because even lawyers need psychologists <laughs> a lot <laughs> so um if you start working with that mentality that you are you are an expert in your own right especially when you come here i know there are voices that are bigger because i had a similar experience you have to constantly remind yourself that you are an expert and not only reminding yourself, but also work towards being an expert in whatever makes you happy. Uh, so I'd say two things. First of all, you being here is already an input. So you're taking away something and you're able to then discuss these topics and these matters to a wider community, which is something that we, I'm saying as academics, don't do enough of, we're too scared of the wider public for some reason. Um, but I think you know, you coming here and engaging with us and then taking something away and then discussing that with your family, with your friends, that is already important and enough in itself. And then also, you're, like everyone's saying here, you're an expert in psychology, you've got expertise, but you've also got a perspective and your own vantage point that can help add and, and instill a new direction, a new way of thinking about psychology. And that can be an African perspective. So yeah, it doesn't matter what discipline you're in, if you can kind of bring that to the table, that's gonna be what's gonna be really useful. We then rethink our kind of understandings of certain relationships we have with one another on a psychological basis, um, based on the various customs and thinking. So, you know, th that ideal is more important than actually focusing on, oh, it's only through law or politics that can, we can engage in this way. I think bringing that perspective to the table is going to help all the disciplines. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I'm happy to see that all of you guys uh, enjoyed the lectures because I have a lot of questions, uh, more that, than I can possibly ask tonight. I have a short five minutes left, so I would like to ask everyone who asked the question through Mentimeter, and it hasn't been answered yet, and it's urgent, please feel free to raise your hand so you can ask it live, um, because again, I have a lot of questions and I won't be able to ask all of them tonight. Yeah, go ahead. So my question is actually to both Deepak and Aurelia. No, it's to all of you. <laughs> um, how would you say that the conception of international law, the way it is in the world right now, um, if it was more holistic, if it was more, if it took account of our um, unique contexts more, would the goals of international law be better achieved? For example, international peace or order security. Uh, okay, uh, this is where the cynic in me comes into play. And I would say no, because uh, the way international law works is it's very dependent upon those hegemonic powers. Um, if those hegemonic powers don't really see an incentive in, in maintaining international peace and security, then it doesn't matter. We look at uh, the Syrian civil war. Um, why there's been no consensus on that situation is because China is very much against intervention. We've got Russia that's quite supportive of, um, of Syria and the regime in play, and you've just got a divide there. So yes, perhaps more perspectives will encourage discussions and encourage perhaps more support. So having, uh, as Ricardo mentioned, 
a more uh, representative um, Security Council would definitely help, but it's still difficult because international law is so dependent upon the political um, drives that are taking place at that time. I would say representation matters, even if uh, it is to, um, let's say, a very minor uh, level. Representation matters because if, for instance, um, I mentioned something about uh, African priorities, having uh, African priorities might be very different from, you know, uh, fighting Russia and Ukraine, you know, that kind of, we might have different priorities that might help in a global setup. So in that sense, if more representation of not only Africa, but other regions of the world apply, then I think we will have a more inclusive, will there be peace per se, or, you know, a, a perfect world? No, but it will be a step towards, yeah, a better application, implementation, and enforcement of international law. Um, yeah, um, I think one way in which um, international law can, could I say, have more faith and be able to achieve the big goals that it sets for itself. It's very much, in my point of view, the, in the um, area of enforcement. Um, it seems that um, some people treat the Geneva Conventions as the Geneva Suggestions. Um, and <laughs> true, true. So it should be um, less reliant on political will of whoever the leader of so, and so big country is, it should be less reliant on that. Uh, we, international law needs to strengthen its enforcement mechanism. I don't know how that can be done, and maybe that is something for Deepak and Aurelia's colleagues to think about. But um, from a you know practical point of view, when you have nice laws, but you cannot enforce them, really, what are those? We really call them laws, you know? So. When, you, when we fix um, the area of enforcement in a fair and you know, impartial way, when that is able to be achieved, then I think the goals will. Because sometimes law is not just relying on good behavior. It's because um, you know that the police will come and arrest you if you don't do the right thing, then it will be most forward. So when international law gets to that point where um, it can be enforceable in a fair and you know, equitable way, manner, then I think we can make great strides in achieving yeah, global peace and all the goals that we set for itself. Mm -hmm.